morning to everybody. It's a pleasure for me to introduce you, Dr. Alessandro Pilloni from Messina University. That's it. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, thank you for introduction and thank you all for attending this class. So um, today we will, hold on, it's not writing. Okay. So um, today we'll uh, go through some of the topics that Professor Maiani discussed yesterday. And in particular, we we'll review some of the, the, the fundamental aspects about what is the quark model in practice. Okay, and why, why we are calling it a model, why we don't talk about UCD. And uh, uh, I will discuss exercises about uh, quark multiplets and interactions. And review some of the Hadron mass formulae. Okay. So we can have some practical exercises about, uh, about this. Well, so this is the outline and let's start from the quark model. So, as you have heard, we are talking about quarks that are fermions, it's been one half particle. They happen to be in six different flavors and we distinguish between the light flavors and the heavy flavors. The name is uh, up, down, strange, char, bot, or top. We will not talk about the top work because it's it's really too heavy to to uh, to be relevant for hadron spectroscopy. Basically, it cannot form hadrons because it's too heavy and and too short lived. So it decays before interacting with the other quarks. Um, what we know is that these three quarks are relatively light. Uh, well, the, the, the up and down are very light and the strange is relatively light compared to the typical um, scale of, of the strong interaction. And that's why we can think about um, a symmetry that connects the, the three. And this is the SU3 flavor symmetry, okay? So that means that if we neglect the small but mass differences between these, they happen to appear in, uh, in triplets and uh, hadron must belong to multiplets of this uh, uh, symmetry, okay? And these are the, the famous way diagrams that you observed yesterday. So for example, talking about quarks, you can put all the possible quarks in this diagram. So you have the up quark, the down quark, and the strange quark. If you put axis in this way, so here you have the strangeness quantum number. So the strangeness mm -hmm. of, the, of the strange quark is minus one conventionally. And here you have, uh, sorry, here you have- Isospin, the, the isospin and, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the strangeness on the vertical axis. Um, so this, this is a very good symmetry, very well satisfied by strong interactions and uh, strangeness is less satisfied because Theoretically speaking, the masses of the of the up quark are order of couple MBB, the down quark order of five MBB, and the strange quark is order of hundred MBB. Typical scale of strong interaction is also called lambda QCD, and depending on the estimate, let's say two to five hundred MBB, depending on on what precise definition you give. So that means that this is the scale that separate the light quark from the heavy quark, while the other masses are much larger. So mass of the charm is order of one, let's say 0.2 GV and mass of the bottom is order of four GV and more. So if you see these numbers, you see that these are pretty different from uh, the one that Professor Miami showed yesterday. So what's the reason for that? I mean, they are both right in some sense. So this is, um, these are the 
theoretical mass that one can extract from the real theory of strong interaction, this QCD. So for example, you have uh, simulations in lattice QCD that allow you to, to give estimates in particular for these light guys here. But what we are dealing with here is the constituent for model. which is a model for QCD. So what's the difference? Well, in real QCD, imagine that you have a meson, for example, a top by plus. Okay, so you put two quarks and immediately you have zillion gluons and QQ bar pairs that form from the vacuum. So this immediately becomes a very complicated multi-body object that is very difficult to treat. Uh, Alternatively, you can say, okay, let me arrange most of the effect of this interaction in uh, uh, effective masses of these guys. So now I have only two massive quarks with mass of order similar of order of 300 MeV, which is basically a third of the mass of the proton, if you, if you, if you like. And now you have some residual strength of interaction mediated by gluons. This is how we gluon interaction. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and you can treat this in, uh, in, uh, with the standard um, potential theory, if you like. Uh, even in a non-relativistic fashion, as most of the post model I'll, I'll show you later. Okay, and so in this way, this is not the original QCD, that is this complicated thing here, uh, but still this captures some of the properties of QCD, it captures the symmetries of QCD, and, and some of the dynamical properties. So now uh, we go from a many-body problem to a simple two-body or, or three-body problem in the case of buttons, okay? And, uh, and um, the price to pay is that the masses and couplings that we have are not the original ones from QCD, but just these effective objects that, that, we, that, that we calculate and we can extract uh, from the other masses, okay? Uh, um, if you want to interrupt me, just uh, don't raise your hand, just unmute your microphone and just go and ask for questions. Don't worry about that. Any questions until now? No, okay. So, new page, and let's go back to this object now. So, we have this quark, and let's restrict for now to the light quark, okay? So, UDS. Um, the other quantum number that characterizes quark is color, okay? So, we know that light quarks belong to this multiplet of SU3 flavor, but they also have a quantum number of color, SU3 color, okay? And we do know that quarks belong to the fundamental representation of the, the color group, okay? So that is also called the, the color triplet, okay? And of course, since the uh, the um, SU3 group is not a, um, is a complex group. The anti-quark belong to the conjugate representation, okay, the so-called three bar. And if I have to, 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 to represent this in the way diagrams I, I showed before, usually you represent the color triplet this way. This is the color triplet and the color anti-triplet, okay? Which happens to be symmetric with respect to the, to the x-axis. Okay, so if we want to put indices, I will use Greek indices for color and Latin indices for flavor. Uh, so as for color, what I can do? So imagine that I have, I have this guy here with alpha running one, two, three, okay? And I can put it together with 
an artwork. And pay attention that I'm, I'm putting the, the color index of the fundamental representation as a, as a lower index. This is the color and the index for the conjugate representation I'm putting up as an upper index, okay? So to distinguish the two, because they don't belong to the same representation. It's not like spin where, you know, particles and other particles have both spin in the same, you know, with both spin of one half. These things are different, so you have to distinguish that somehow. So I will use lower and upper indices. Uh, on the other hand, if I have two quarks or two antiquarks, I have to put them on the same level. Okay. So now I can see how these things transform. So I know that with a single index, the quark isn't fundamental. Uh, if I have two indices in general, something like this how I can see what are the, uh, the so-called irreducible representations, so the way these guys transform. Well, here I show something that looks like a scalar product, okay? So this guy doesn't seem to, 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 to change. If we rotate, for example, uh, the things in the space of color, this, this thing doesn't change. So it's basically a scalar product. So that, that means that it's, uh, it's trivial under rotation in this space. So this corresponds to the so-called color singlet. Okay. And if I start in from this, I can always separate this color singlet by doing this times third. This is Q gamma, Q bar gamma and the rest, okay? So this is Okay, so what I've done here, alpha belong to the fundamental representation, so it's three, and I'm combining this with an index in the anti-fundamental representation. So what I'm doing in the language of, of representation is the, the fundamental times the anti-fundamental, okay? And here I'm seeing that this corresponds to something that belongs to the singular representation because it's trivial. It just, you know, doesn't change if I act with rotation in this space, which and decomposes in this singlet. And if you count here is the original nine component minus the trace basically, so this is the octet representation, okay? And this is valid for color, but of course this is generic about groups, so it will be the same for, for flavor. So if I had to do the same exercise, Q and Q bar, I have QI, QJ, and I can do exactly the same math and then separating in this way the mesons in flavor multiplets, and I've just built the octet plus the singlet that also belongs here in the middle. That is another singlet. Okay. And these are the so called weight diagrams. Weight. that we use to, um, to, to, um, to organize the, the multiplets of objects, okay? Questions about this? Okay. Okay, so this is clear. Now we understand how to make sense of combining a quark and an anti-quark. Let's see what happens when we combine two quarks, okay? What if I have Q alpha, Q beta, okay? Well, now I cannot use the trace because you see that the delta function has one lower index and one upper index, so I cannot do the same. Um, but what I can do is that I can divide this multiplet in terms of its symmetric properties. So I can separate uh, the symmetric part 
from the anti-symmetric part. As simple as this. I'm writing the symmetric combination. And the anti-symmetric one. Okay. This is symmetric and this is anti-symmetric. Okay. And if I count the indices here, I starting three times three. So I expect to have nine indices. And if I count the number of symmetric combination, if I have two indices, these are six. And uh, uh, if I count the anti-symmetric, this is three. But actually, this happens to transform in the conjugate representation. And I can see that uh, by rewriting it this way, using the Kronecker delta in order to have to see that this is explicitly anti-symmetric, alpha, beta, gamma, and using the properties of uh, uh, delta half lambda, using the, the, the properties of, of the Kronecker delta, this, this one half, oh, sorry. Q delta, Q lambda. Okay, so, well, this is an invariant tensor, but this object here, okay, you see that it contains two quark, but here it has only one upper index, okay, so it's an upper index, so that means that this transform has the conjugate representation of the fundamental. So that's why we call it three bar. And these are all color in this case. Okay. So what we learn is that if we have two quarks, we can divide them in the six symmetric representation plus the anti-triplet, which is anti-symmetric, okay? So now let's consider in total the wave function of these two quarks, okay? Since we have Pauli principle, if, if these quarks are, are uh, identical, uh, I mean, they are fermions, so we have to, 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 um, to choose the wave function in such a way that the whole wave function is anti-symmetric under exchange of the two quarks, okay? So what does this mean? That the wave function of this is the product of a color wave function and the product and a flavor wave function, a spin wave function, and an orbital wave function. Okay. And if these quarks are identical, that means uh, it, either they are really the same quark or they are they they belong to this SU3 symmetry. So if, if we are neglecting the small mass differences between the two quarks, we have to take care of this uh, uh, anti-symmetry. Okay. Um, so this three bar is particularly interesting for uh, a reason that I will explain uh, a bit later. So let's let's just start from this example. So let's let's focus on just um, the wave function we color in this anti-triplet. So we say this is anti-symmetric. We have to to impose that the overall symmetry is odd under exchange. Okay, so we need that the product of this is uh, anti-symmetric, and we restrict to the S wave because we want to talk about the lowest lying uh, hadrons. So we don't care about the orbital excitations. So this is always symmetric, okay? So we have these two options to play with. Uh, so we can have two combination, either anti-symmetric, anti-symmetric, that 
for SU3 flavor is, as we, as we just saw, the the three bar representation as well happens to be uh, anti-symmetric. And for spin, spin belongs, belongs to the SU2 group, okay? And uh, uh, what's the representation that is anti-symmetric in spin? It's the spin singlet, right? The, the spin singlet of two particles of spin one half is anti-symmetric under the exchange, okay? So this, this is one possibility for the wave function. The other possibility, since we want to stick to this uh, color anti-triplet, is to have the, the two symmetric representations. Okay, this is always S wave. Okay, and what are the symmetric representations? Well, here we just discussed that for SU3, the, the sextuplet is, uh, is, um, is symmetric. And for spin, the triplet is, uh, is symmetric, OK? So you can see that if we restrict to this, uh, to this three bar color representation, you can have two possible options if you have two quarks. You have um, two quarks in spin 0 and in the, in the anti-triplet of flavor. Or you can have the two quarks in spin one, and and then the flavor is sex. Okay. In particular, if you have two identical quarks, let's say two U quarks, of course this must be symmetric in flavor. So there is no way you can find U U in this three bar representation that is anti-symmetric. So that means that if you have two identical quarks, this kind, you have always color in three bar, and then you must have the spin triplet, OK? OK, so the, uh, that means the two identical quarks in a hadron always appear with relative spin one, OK? Any questions about that? Okay. Elena, you say something? Si, si. No, I think that uh, you can continue. Okay. okay so uh, this is how we uh, understand the quantum numbers and establish the quantum numbers of um, core pairs. What happens in hadrons? Well, in hadrons, you know, you have two options. So you have mesons, that is QQ bar, and you have baryons, which is three quarks, OK? And uh, the phenomenology of confinement forces us to consider only colored singlet. OK, so we saw before that uh, when you consider uh, a quark and an anti-quark, in general, they, 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 they start from nine color states that they compose in a singlet and an octet. OK, so as for color, this is singlet plus octet, and you only focus on the singlet. For three quarks, this is a bit more complicated because now you have three times three times three, okay? All the three in the fundamental representation. Uh, we saw that this three times three, we can write as six plus three bar, okay? Now, six times three, whatever it does, it doesn't give you a singlet, but this three times three bar 
it does because we just calculated it here. So it's the color of that plus the color singlet. Okay. So you do have a color singlet with three ports. Okay. So you can form bions. Bions do exist. Uh, but the thing that you learn from this is that inside bions, two quarks can only belong to the three bar representation because you need the, the three bar in order to form the final color singlet. Okay. That's why earlier I restricted to the case of, of the, the um, of the color anti triplet for two quarks, okay? Because in binaries, that's all we can have, okay? So these two quarks always belong to the, to the color three bar, okay? For flavor, there are no such restrictions. Indeed, there is no, we are not forced to form a flavor singlet. We can have all kinds of flavors. We have flavor octet in the case of mesons, and we have the lowest line octet of mesons. And we can have uh, flavor octet for uh, for balance as well, and the, the flavor decuplet. And maybe I'll I'll talk about that later. Okay. Any questions? Is there anybody alive connected? Uh, feel free to make question to Alessandro. Okay, it means that uh, they have understood everything. You are very good, uh, Alessandro. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask sure. you a question, sure. maybe? Uh, could you explain a little <laughs> bit why the seats times three doesn't give any uh, singulate? Yes. Uh, well, I will not give you the details of how you calculate this. Naively, you can think of a geometrical method if you start from the weight, the, the weight diagram, okay? So for the, the six representation is something that looks like this, roughly. Okay. And now you want to combine with the, the three representation that looks like this, okay? That means for each of these points, you have to sum this. That in, in, in some sense, it means you have to, to build three new things. OK? OK. And if you see what are the geometrical figures this decomposes in, this is the so-called decuplet plus the octet. Where the, um, where the decuplet looks like this. One, two, three, four, three, two, one. And the octet is the, the usual octet. And indeed, it doesn't happen for the color group, but this does happen for the flavor group. Okay, if you combine three three quarks, you can have the decuplet of flavor. And uh, these are, well, I, I, I think we discussed, that, that was shown yesterday. OK, here you have the, the delta, the delta baryons. These are the baryons of spin three outs. OK, then you have the sigmas, the, the cascade, and the omega minus. And, and here you have the standard uh, uh, Baryon octet. Okay, so proton neutron, the three cells. <laughs> okay, and the two cascade. Okay, and you can see there are no, no, no singlet here. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, but, well, there are methods to, to, to calculate these things. The, the easiest, for example, are the, the, the Young tableau. But I, I don't think I'll go into the kind of details for now, at least. Maybe if we have some free time later, we can, we can discuss it quickly. Okay. okay. 
Please, other question. I, I see messages in chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Please Thank don't you. don't use the chat because I don't have enough hands. Just unmute yourself. And, and oh no, they want you only to say that everything is clear. Yeah, I now see. now I read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is that fine? Good. Okay, so now we kind of classified pairs of quarks or quark and quark based on their quantum numbers, uh, but we haven't talked at all about their interactions. Okay, so let's see what happens in the case. Professor Mayani yesterday showed this kind of diagram. So you have a quark that interacts by uh, an anti-quark or, you know, it can be either another quark or an anti-quark by uh, a gluon exchange, okay? And this is related to the potential, if you take the non-relativistic limit between the, the two quarks. And the, the relevant piece that I'll, I'll discuss in a second is related to the, the product of the spins of the of the two quarks. Well, I, I, I will talk about two quarks, but it can be either two quarks or quark and an antiquark. Okay. And uh, um, I wanna tell you something more about uh, how these things arise and where this uh, this um, this turn comes from. First of all. Let's start from the easy things, okay? So let's step back to electrodynamics, okay? So let's put just a photo here, okay? So this diagram, if you write this amplitude here, this is something like U bar, gamma mu, mu, mu gamma mu, U times, if you have an antiquark, it's like, like V bar gamma mu V, okay? And you can take this, study the non-relativistic limit, and you end up, if you do all the calculations that are lengthy and tedious and not particularly interesting, uh, you end up with a formula like this, okay? Once you calculate First, the non-relativistic limit, so you are in momentum space, and then you Fourier transform uh, with respect to the exchange momentum, and this is the definition of your potential in coordinate space, okay? And you get a term like this, okay? So something that depends on the relative coordinate between the two quarks and, and, uh, and also their momentum. Okay, so you see that the first term that you have here is just the one over R potential is the Coulomb term, okay? Uh, they would be there even if the particles would have spin, okay? It's just for, for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the simple, you know, the simple one photon exchange basically correspond to the, to the simple Coulomb interaction, okay? Uh, and then you have the other terms. Part of these are related to the spin, well, first of all, where does the spin come from? I have gamma matrices, okay? And gamma matrices, if I use the Birkin and Drell basis in the, in the, uh, the, 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 the special uh, gamma I contain the Pauli matrices on the off-diagonal term. So this is a source of this uh, spin interaction. And the other one is that the lower component of the, of the Dirac, um, of the Dirac spinors, you know, the, the, the U and V that I wrote, also contain spin matrices, okay? So once you take the non-relativistic limit, this is where all these uh, this, this spin terms comes from, okay? Um, so let's, let's give a quick look to all this. So this term only depends on the on moment and coordinate. And you can see that this is basically an orbit-orbit term, okay? Something that couples the orbital momentum 
of the two uh, of the two ports. Here you have something that is like this R vector P, this is L, so this is a spin orbit term, and the same for this. Same here, same here, all spin orbit terms. Um, here you have something that maybe it's not easy to see, but this transform as a, a tensor, um, uh, something with angular momentum two in the in the coordinate variables. Okay, so if you're interested in S wave hadrons, uh, basically we cannot have these terms coupling with L because there is no L. And, and similar to this, this, this tensor there transforms a spin two, okay? And it cannot be a spin two coupling to, 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 to spin zero. I said spin, I meant orbital angular momentum, okay? I cannot have something that's also like a, a tensor of rank two sandwiched between two, um, two things with orbital angular momentum zero, okay? So all these terms here are negligible for our discussion. Uh, the only relevant terms remain the Coulomb part and this pink coupling here, okay? So you can see that uh, this first term here basically doesn't depend on, on relevant degrees of freedom. Basically, it just gives you a different offset. So if you consider um, if you consider mass differences, I mean that usually you can easily neglect this. And the only thing that remains to discuss is this spin term interaction. Okay, so let me go back to the note. This is a spin spin term that is proportional. Well, there is a constant, a numerical constant. There is a three dimensional delta function. You have the product of spin and the two inverse, the two mass, masses. Okay. First of all, you see that these are all terms that vanish in the static limit. If you send the mass to infinity, uh, the spin of the of the quark, basically the couples, has no relevance whatsoever, and um, and indeed you, you can see that you have multi, uh, multiplets in, in spin in the uh, in the very heavy mesons. So you have the so-called heavy quark spin symmetry. We're not going to discuss in detail, but just. To, to, to tell you where this comes from. It comes from the fact that all these uh, spin interactions are suppressed by the mass of the, of the quark, okay? Um, all right, spin, spin. Um, so that means that if we consider the, 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 um, the average over some baryon, for example, of this Hamiltonian spin spin, this is what? Well, it's the sum over all possible pairs of quarks in the baryon. You have well, this numerical constant gives you the splitting. Uh, the modulus squared, the delta function gives you the function, the origin, okay? And you can fairly assume that this doesn't change much in the various uh, variance in the same multiplets. So you can assume that this is also constant. And then you have 
this interaction space P. When you have M1, M2, and you can absorb all this in a single so-called magnetic couple. Okay, magnetic because it couples to, to this spin, and you can see that this is basically the effect of the of the magnetic interaction of the photon. Okay. Any questions? Yes, I have a question. Sure. <laughs> um, I don't understand uh, the reason why we can uh, neglect uh, um, many parts of the Hamiltonian, uh, except for the spin-spin uh, interaction and the Colombian terms. Yeah, so let me go back to the paper. Uh, by the way, I mean, I, I, I didn't tell you, but this is uh, the um, uh, the Rucula Georgia um, the Rucula Clasho Georgiai paper. I mean, the, one one of the of the first ones about this court model. Um, so the reason is that, in principle, they should be there, and more refined calculations take all these pieces into account. Uh, but now we are specifically interested into uh, uh, the, the lightest atoms, okay? So we are considering only, let me write this explicitly, only S-wave atoms. Okay, we are not considering the orbital excitations, okay? So if you sandwich this Hamiltonian that contains the orbital angular momentum into a state that doesn't have an angular momentum because it's S wave, the, the, the expected value of this L is zero. Okay. Okay. And this happens for this piece here, this piece here, and this piece is here. This guy here transform as an object with L equal two. Okay. So if you consider the the, 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 the spherical tensor or the wigner eckhart theorem, if you like, if you have something that has L equal zero, here's something with two indices that transform with, mm, as something having L equal two. And here you sandwich again with something with L equal zero. This should mm, this is proportional to the Klebsch Gordon that basically sums these two objects and, and gives you the, the final one. Of course, there is no Klebsch Gordon yet that gives you zero plus two equals zero. Okay, perfect. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah, so this also vanishes. We are left with this. There is basically constant in, in the multiplets we are talking about. So it just gives you a constant offset. So if we consider just uh, mass differences, it doesn't matter. And that's why the only relevant term is, is, is this one. OK, it's clear. Thanks. The other thing that I forgot to tell you, so thank you for asking questions, because then I, you know, I start thinking about all the things I have to say, is that um, this interaction here is flavor independent in the sense it's the same as always this form. Yes, always this form, regardless of the nature of the quarks we are considering. The only information about the nature of the quarks enters throughout the mass. So it's purely kinematical. There is no different coupling for you know, each flavor. OK? So th this interaction is flavor blind. And indeed, in the case of QED, we know that the only relevant information is the charge of the two things, OK? At least for point-like particles, OK? Now, what happens if we go to QCD? 
you are replacing the photon with a gluon. The form of the interaction is the same, but now you have to insert the Gelman matrices, TA, TA. Are you any familiar with the Gelman matrices? It's the generators of the SU3 group. Well, divided by two in the standard normalization. Okay. So here you have, and if you put color indices now, if we say that this guy has alpha, alpha prime, beta, beta prime, now you have also to consider this. this color matrix is here. Okay. Well, uh, I guess it should be beta prime beta. Sorry, can you speak louder? I suppose uh, for anti-quark you should switch the indices. I mean, like transpose. Uh, right, I mean, right. It was just sketched. That depends on the, on the representation you have here. Uh, but um, well, here I'm not, you see, I'm not specifying between quark and anti quark because I, I, I put this, so I'm just being sloppy. And you know, what I should write is that these T matrices could belong to different representation, and I should take care of this. Okay, but um, I, I'm going there in a minute. Okay, at, at this stage, I'm, I'm just writing formally that I have to consider also this contribution from the color matrices. And the form, the important relevant information is that this is factorized, okay? Because these in indices don't mix with the rest. So I can calculate this once and for all, once and for all, depending on whether I'm considering quarks or anti quarks, so depending on the representation of these guys and add another color coefficient in front of this, okay? But the form of the interaction is basically the same, okay? Any other questions on this? It's important to know if uh, the students know this color matrices, um, the generator of SO3, because if not, uh, this can be done uh, in one of the, the, the next uh, uh, lessons. I know. <laughs> we have to go one by one and ask. Maybe you can uh, you can write on the chat. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is an information that we need on. Yeah. So for now, I I, I assume that Maybe Alessandro will assume that you know, and uh, yeah. you write in the chat, or, or better, the the one that uh, would prefer to have something more in details can write on yeah. the chat, and that way we will dedicate some time. Okay. Yeah, I I assume that you know. Okay, everyone is writing that that knows. So I assume you know what this form will be. Okay, and this holds for any representation of the Gelman matrices, okay? And this can be for the fundamental representation, for the entire fundamental, for the octet, for uh, that is also called the adjoint representation, and, and this is generic. And these constants are the so-called structure constants of the SU3 group. Okay. So what do we have to do here is to calculate this TA alpha alpha prime, TA 
beta beta prime, knowing that these belong to different representations. Okay, so uh, let me write this. I don't know. I, I don't have space for more indices. This is our representation R, and this is our representation R prime. Okay, so and and these act on different spaces because one matrix is acts on the color index of this upper line and one matrix acts on the color index of the of this lower line okay so written this way it looks a bit abstract um, but there is an obvious um, intuition if one think of su2 so uh, what would be the equivalent for spin for spin it would be in that you have it's exactly the same kind of, of um, functional form we have for the spin part because you are summing over all the possible components of spins that act on the space of two different particles. Okay. So this is just uh, a, a more mathematical way of writing this object here. And of course, uh, the two particles can have different spin, that means they belong to different representations. Okay. So it's exactly the same thing just written for, um, for, for the SU3 form. And we can treat this the same way. I mean, for spin, we know that you have to combine the two spins and then consider the spin squared, that is, uh, diagonal in the multiplet is the so-called Casimir of the group. Okay. Where S squared means the total spin squared. So mm, total spin squared means, of course, Sx squared plus Sy squared plus Sc squared. Uh, this means it's the quadratic form built on the generator of the group. Okay. It's also called the Casimir. The quadratic Casimir because it's the quadratic form. In general, there are also other Casimirs that we, we are not interested in. So I can write the same here. This is the quadratic Casimir. So let me call it C2 as is customary in, in the literature of the representation that combines the two whatever we choose it to be, minus the Kaisen here of representation R, well, let me call it R1 and R2 just for analogy, minus the Casimir of R2, okay? And it's basically the same, the same form as this guy here, okay? So calculating what's the sign of this color coefficient, so to understand whether this interaction makes, well, first of all, whether the interaction between quarks and anti quarks is attractive or repulsive, that depends on this color coefficient. So that uh, interaction will make the hadron lighter and repulsive will make it heavier, of course. Um, but in order to understand whether the the sign of this is negative or positive, we have to calculate this thing here, okay? So that means we have to know what is the Casimir for various representations. In general, I mean, there is a formula for, um, for um, value for SU3 in general, depending on, the, on, on any representation, but I'll show you how to build this starting from the fundamental representation if you have products of the fundamental representation. I don't know if you want to stop for five minutes. Elena? Okay, we, you can stop for five minutes. Okay. Any question before we stop? That would be a good time. Uh, yeah, if I may. Sure. Um, 
You specified earlier that uh, the first representation given with the alpha, alpha prime indices was uh, acting on different degrees of freedom than the beta, beta prime indices, if I understood correctly. Sure. So, I mean, this is a very naive question, but why don't they just trivially commute? I mean, like... Well, they, they do commute. I mean, oh, the problem okay. is not the fact that they commute. The problem is you want to calculate... I mean, you can see that this guy here, it's, it's a constant times a delta function. It's a okay, delta of alpha, alpha prime, delta of beta, beta prime times a constant. And you want to calculate what this constant is. Same way as this guy here. Okay. So let's 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 think for a second how it works with spin. Imagine that you have two particles of spin one half. Okay. What you would write if you have something like this, you have a first Pauli matrix that acts, you know, this is a matrix, so yes, and this is ij, but it acts on the spins of, or on, on the degrees of freedom of particle one, okay? There you have a special index, x, y, z. There you have another Pauli matrix, but this acts on the, on, the, on the spin variable of a different particle. So they do belong to different spaces. You, you agree with that? You still there? Yes, sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. That, that's helpful. Yeah. And so now if you use this formula, you know that Casimir, so this quadratic form on the same multiplet. Okay, so if you if you stick to um, the so-called irreducible representations, that means the one that have definite total spin, the the this guy here is what? It's s times s plus one minus s one s1 plus 1 minus s2 s2 plus 1 times a bunch of delta function uh, sorry yeah okay and it's the same business here I mean, these guys are trivial, it's just delta function. The color flows from, from the, the initial to the final quark. But the thing we are interested in is calculating this number here. OK, great. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions on this? So here I should write the delta function I didn't write, delta alpha, alpha prime, delta beta, beta prime. I have a question. Sure. Uh, it's regarding those like this or... Sorry, can, can you just speak closer to the microphone? Uh, it's about the tensors that you started with. Uh, you had like lower indices and upper indices for uh -huh. yep. three and three bar. Suppose you had uh, constituent gluons. Oh, so yeah. What would, be, what would you use then? Uh, then I would have to consider an object let's call it constituent gluon with one upper and, uh, and one lower indices such that the trace is zero. So, like, so what is the form of this G? Well, G doesn't have a form. It's like, it's like Q. I mean, Q is Q, right? So you, you, you don't know what's the content. You only know that it has an index. 
and the same for G, G will have two indices. So the only thing you know is that if you put this in these indices to, to be the same and you sum over alpha, this is zero. So, there are so like you can eight, build other ones like this. Quantities. Sorry? There are eight of those quantities. Indeed, because it's three times three is nine, but we one condition. So you have eight. And you can build hadrons this way, for example. Well, you can, you know. Either saturate this way, and now you have a, a two gluon global. Um, you can have, <coughs> you can have hybrid built this way. Okay. Okay. And so on and so forth. You can have three, the, the oddball, which is a three gluon. Saturating with the with the structure constant. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any other question? Okay, if not, uh, okay, so let's, let's take five minutes. You tell me when. I think we can restart, Alessandro. Okay. So let's summarize where we are. We have this interaction here that is uh, inspired by one gluon exchange. We see that the fact that we have a non abelian theory, it, it just tells you that you have to insert these color matrices here. And now we are gonna calculate what's the factor that the color coefficient that, that appears because of this, uh, of this color interaction. So the idea is this, if you, if you insert these two matrices, you get a combination of the Casimir of the representation of uh, each individual thing that's interacting, so either the quark or the anti-quark, and the Casimir of the representation, these two things belong together, okay? So we have to calculate this for the cases, for the cases that we're interested in. So we have a quark and anti-quark, uh, the combined representation can be the singlet or the octet, so we need to calculate this for singlet and octet. Um, if you have two quarks, then uh, the, the combined representation can be, can be the sextet or the, or the anti-triplet. So we have to calculate the Casimir of all of this, okay? Um, how you calculate the Casimir? Well, first of all, let's start from this fact. That is the normalization of the matrices. Okay, so for the fundamental representation, we know that these are defined this way. Okay, in general, this number here depends on the representation and it's called the Dinkin index of the representation. Okay. K of R, okay? 
So in general, we have that the trace of two generators in a representation R is this Dinkin index. And we just say that for the fundamental, same for the anti-fundamental, this is one half. OK. What is the Casimir? The Casimir is the quadratic form that you can build out of two generators. OK. And you can see that because of the sure lemma, this, so this commutes with all the uh, with all the generators of the group, and uh, uh, for the sure lemma in uh, in a given rep in reducible representation, uh, if something commutes with all the generators of the algebra, uh, then the um, this is the identity matrix in dimension R times a number. That is what we are calling the the Casimir of this representation too. So how this is related to the thinking index? Well, if we trace this, on one hand, we can use this formula. Now we have the trace acting on the identity matrix of representation L, R. So the dimension of this identity matrix is R, and the trace of an identity matrix R times R is R. Okay, just the number. Or we can use this formula here, okay, and multiply by the Kronecker delta of AB. And then you will get the, the, the Dinkin index of the representation R times delta AA, which is the number of the generators of the group. The number of the generators of the group, it's the dimensions of generators. That for SU3, this is, or for SUN, it's, uh, square minus one. So for SU3 is eight, is the number of generators, the number of gluons. Okay. And this gives you the relation between a Casimir and the Dinkin index. So to calculate this, that means we can just calculate the Dinkin index of given representations. And we use this to formula, that is, what's the Dinkin index for a representation that is the direct product of two different representations? Well, this is the trace. Well, Delta AB times the Dinkin index is the trace of TATB, but written in this product representation. Okay. What does this mean? What this product means? That they act on different uh, on different spaces. So the formal way, the, what this means in practice is that this TA here is TA when that's on the representation one times nothing happens in the representation two or the other way around. Okay, and the same for B.
Okay. Is that clear? I mean, let, uh, it's the same when you consider the sum of two different uh, spins. So imagine that you have spin one and you write spin one plus spin two. What does this mean? When spin act, spin one acts only on the on the indices of particle one and spin two only on the indices of particle two. So that means that formally speaking, you have always something like this. So spin one times nothing happens for particle two or spin two times, oh sorry, or nothing happens in particle one times spin two, okay? So this is what this combining these two representation means, okay? Is this passage clear? Yes. Okay. So now we can distribute this. So if we multiply two tensor products, remember that the left side and right side happen on different variables. On, uh, act on different spaces. So you can just multiply the two left parts and the two right parts. So this is TA R1, TB R1 times identity. Okay, right, right. Plus R1 times TA, TB. Okay, from this and this, plus this. Okay. Now, since the left side and right side happens on different spaces, the trace is just the product of the traces. Okay. So well, this is trace of TA TATB times the trace of one R2. and all the rest. So what is this? This is just delta AB and the Dinkin index of representation, so this was one, of representation one. And here I have the trace of identity in representation two. Okay, so that's the dimension of representation two. If I do the same here, is the other way around. So dimension of representation one and the Dinkin index of representation two. And these pieces have the trace, the separate trace of TA in representation one times the trace of TB in representation two. But the trace of the generators of SU3 vanishes, okay? So these pieces don't, don't contribute, okay? So we found this formula for the Dinkin indices of, two of the product of two representations. Okay. What happens if you consider the direct sum now of two representations? Direct sum means basically that you have representations that are 
diagonals in block. No. Sorry, one sec. Seems like Alexa likes thinking indices. Okay, so you see when I take the trace of something like this, I'm just taking the sum of the two traces over the two diagonal blocks. So long story short, this is just the sum of the Dinkin indices. Okay. Okay, now that we derive this, we can apply this to the cases we are interested in. That is singlet, octet, and, uh, and sextet. So we can say, let's start from this. What's the Dinkin index of combining three times three bars? So this is the case of quartan type work. Okay. We follow this rule and we say, okay, it's the dimension of the three, which is three times the index of the three bar, Dinkin index plus same. And this is of course three, here we say it is one half and the same. Okay. Well, this is also the same as we say that three, three times three bar is one plus eight. And the sum of this is the Dinkin index of the singlet. The singlet doesn't have anything, so the coefficient can only be zero. Okay. So this is telling us that the, that the Dinkin index of the octet is three. Okay, let's do the same for three times three. This part here has exactly the same number. So this is three, one half plus three times one half. What's the difference here? Here I have three bar times six, uh, plus six, sorry. Which is the Dinkin index of the three bar, which is one half, plus the index of the six. That means the index of the six is five halves. Okay. Questions? Okay, so now I can go back to the relation between the Dinkin index and the Casimir, the, this, that is here, okay? So the Casimir is the Dinkin index times the dimension, the number of generators divided by the dimensional representation. So that means that for the octet, this is K8 times the number of generators is eight and the dimension of the representation is eight as well. Okay, so that means that the Casimir of the octet is three. The Casimir of the sextet is six, eight divided by six, okay. 
So it's five halves times four thirds. Okay, so it's ten thirds. And even if I didn't write it, the Casimir of the fundamental representation, this is K3, A time over three, the dimension of the representation, which is four thirds, okay? K of three is the usual normalization is one half. Okay. And from this, we can calculate this for all the representations, R1, R2. So if you have two quarks, so let's say, three times three to give me six and anti-triplet. I have to do one half, well, let me write the formula here in general again, is one half C2 of the total representation minus C2 of R1 minus C2 of R2. So here is one half ten thirds minus four thirds minus four thirds, which is one third. For three bar, it's four thirds minus four thirds minus four thirds, which is minus two thirds. So you see a difference in sign between the sextet and the anti-triplet. Uh, if, we, if we go back to the diagram and think for a second about the, the, the QED, the photon exchange, here what we didn't write because it was kind of obvious is that in the case of QED, you have the product of the two charges, okay? So if the product is negative, the interaction unit is attractive. And if the product is positive, same sign, the, the, um, the interaction is repulsive. Here is more complicated because you have a non-abelian exchange. And that then depends on the, on the representation the two particles belong to. But the idea is the same. This sign here controls whether the interaction is attractive or repulsive, okay? If it's negative, it's like opposite charges, so it's attractive. If it's positive, it's repulsive. So you see that the sextet is repulsive and the um, anti-triplet is attractive. What happens for quark anti-quark? This is. three times three bar. So this can be either one on eight. The singlet has nothing, so the casing can only be you know, just zero. Minus four thirds twice. So then it's minus four thirds. So the singlet is attractive. And the octet is three. So the octet is repulsive, okay? So this is telling us another interesting ingredient. So in baryons, the only possibility for the two quarks in order to form a, um, a, a whole color singlet is that two quarks belong to the three bar representation. But there is also this uh, intuition that the three bar itself is attractive over the six, okay? So Professor Magliani will talk about this in the afternoon. Uh, this suggests that type quarks, so bound state of two quarks do exist, not only 
invariance, invariance because they don't have other options, because you have to form the, 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 the whole column singlet of the Hadron, but also as independent objects because their interaction is attractive. Okay, and this will be the object of the, the, the lecture of, of the afternoon. Any questions on this? Okay, so the net effect with respect to QED interaction is that here we have to add uh, minus two thirds if we consider the, um, the interaction of two quarks in the anti-triplet or a minus four thirds if we consider a QQ bar interaction in a messing, in a, in a, in a color scene. Okay, so it's just an, yet another number to consider. Now let's try to understand hadron masses with this formula. And let's consider so mass form. Let's consider, for example, the octet of bions. So let me. Let me write this here again. Proton, neutron. Here you have the sigmas, sigma zero, sigma minus. Here you have another singlet, which is the lambda, I suspend singlet. And and here you have uh, the cascade zero and minus. Okay. Let's try and understand the relations of between masses of this. Um, for example, let's start from the proton. The proton core content is UUD. Okay. Here we are only considering uh, we, we don't switch from uh, from baryon to mesons. So the color factor they will have is always the same. It's always the one of color anti triplet. So it's always the minus two thirds. So you can absorb that into the the cap. Um, so what's the, what's the mass of the proton? It's something that comes out of the Coulomb part of the Hamiltonian that doesn't depend on flavor, doesn't depend on color, doesn't depend on spin, doesn't depend on anything. So you expect it to be basically the same across the whole multiplet. So it's just you know, some constant common factor M0. And let me also tell you that, of course, the Coulomb part is not the end of the story because the potential is confining. So there are a more refined version of that that is not only the Coulomb part. Um, but um, since we are only interested in the mass splitting, that, that's not really relevant to us. So what else do we know here? That we have the sum over all possible spin spin interaction times a chromomagnetic coupling, where I am absorbing the color factor, the, um, the, the, the inverse of the mass that appears in the formula, and the value of the wave function in the origin. Okay. And let me put a two factor for convenience. And here I have the product over all possible spins. So I have the spin of the down quark times, let me put this this way, the spin of the first up quark, the spin of the second up quark, 
and the product of the two upcore spins. Okay. So I told you earlier that uh, if I have two identical quark, they can only be in a spin triplet. They must be spin one to satisfy Pauli principle. Okay. So you know that this guy has spin one, and you know that the sum of this has spin one. So you can write this way. This is what, this is the total spin This is the total spin of the proton squared minus spin down squared minus the spin of the two up quark squared and I can delete this factor of two. And from here, I have the spin of the two up quark squared minus spin of the first quark minus the spin of the second. Okay. If you plot numbers, So this is proton has spin one half, so this is three quarter, and this is also three quarter, three quarter, three quarter, okay? So the result is minus three halves. Okay? Any question on this? Good. So let's let's look what happens for the um, for the the sigma, for example. Any of the three sigma, because isospin is a very good symmetry, so we assume it's exact. So um, how is the, the sigma made of? It's UD has, you have a strange quark, but this UD must be isospin one because the sigma is, you see an isospin triplet. And for the same um, symmetry consideration we, we, we made, at the beginning of a lecture, this means that also the spin must be one, okay? Because isospin one is symmetric, so you need also the spin to be symmetric, okay? Because the color, of course, is anti-symmetric, and so the overall uh, wave function is anti-symmetric. Okay, so for the sigma, we know that the UD part is spin one. So for the mass of the sigma, Here I can write in terms of the quark masses. So I have two light quarks. Here I could explicit for the case of the proton, this would be three light quark masses. So here I have two quark masses and one strange quark, which is slightly heavier, plus the spin interaction. So what I have, I have two light quarks. But I also have this the spin of the strange times the sum of the two. I know how this Chromatic coupling scale with masses, so I'm going to that 
in a second. Let's first calculate this. So we just said that the, this is s to d squared minus s to squared minus s to d squared. And we said that this must be, it's spin one, okay? So this, this guy is two minus three quarters minus three quarters. And here I have um, the total spin of the sigma squared minus the, the spin of the S quark squared minus the spin of UD squared, which is three quarters minus three quarters minus two. Okay. So here you have one half and here you have minus two. Okay, so now let's count how many variables we have. We have masses for, if we neglect isospin for four baryons, because we have proton or neutron, we have the sigmas, the lambda, and the cascade. So we have four masses. That depends on five variables. That is the two quark masses, the light quark and the strange quark, and three different chromomagnetic couplings, the QQ, the QS, and the SS, okay? So you have way two unknowns, okay? But again, use the fact that you know how these things scale with masses. So we know that KQQ, it's basically constant, let me call it C, times the mass of the light core squared and KQS, you can assume it's the same constant because that, that would be related to the wave function in the origin, okay? So it shouldn't be that different from, from other in the same multiplet. Okay, you have this. Now, the, the strange quark is heavier, but not dramatically heavier than the, the, the light quark masses, at least talking about constituent quark masses, okay? So you can think of expanding in the difference this way. You have ms minus mq that becomes one plus delta M over MQ. That become one minus delta M over MQ. And this is basically your original KQQ minus some delta K. Okay. And if you were to do KSS, they would be the same with this squared. So if you, at, at first order in delta M, this is twice. Delta K. Okay. 
Any questions? Um, Alessandro, we have still 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'm almost. Okay. Good. Okay. So let's keep this in mind and we'll use them later. And now let's calculate the mass of the other variants in the multiplet. So mass of lambda and mass of psi. Quickly, so the lambda, lambda is still UDS, but this time the UD is in isospin equal zero. And so for the discussion we made earlier is also in spin equal zero. So the mass of lambda is twice like quark masses plus the mass of the strange plus twice the same formula as here. Okay. It's the very same story, but now the spin of the UD part is zero. So that means this is zero, minus three quarter, minus three quarters. And here you have the spin, of course, it's no longer the sigma, but it's the lambda, but the number is the same. Three quarters minus three quarters minus zero. Okay, so this guy is zero. So you only have two and two plus ms minus three halves kqq. Okay. And the last one is the cascade, which has two strange quarks and one light quark. Okay. So I can consider the interaction of any of the strange quarks uh, I haven't written here is SS. Uh, for example, the, the neutral one is SSU, okay? Um, so I can write the interaction of the up quark with any of the strange quarks, the same way I did it earlier for the proton, plus the interaction of the two strange quarks. And as for the proton, the two strange quark must be in spin one because those are trivially symmetric in flavor. So, so here we have, uh, this is a plus, sorry. Here we have the total spin squared of the cascade minus the spin of the up quark minus the spin of the two S quarks plus KSS. I'm sorry, this is also a scalar product. And here we have SSS squared minus SS1 squared minus S. S2 squared. Okay, you're almost done.
So what we have here, this is three quarters minus three quarters minus two. And here we have two minus three quarters minus three quarters, okay? So all together, this is minus two KQS um, plus one half KSS, okay? So if I use this simplification here, uh, I have three parameters now because I have only KQ of the couplings and two masses to calculate for uh, masses for variance, okay? So that means there must be some relation between the masses of these variance that allow me to eliminate all the, the, the variance, okay? Can I ask is... you a question? Sorry? Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, and in the formula, in the previous formula um, of uh, KQQ. Yeah. The, yeah. 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 Um, in the last uh, um, equal, um, equality where you write C over MQ square times one minus delta M divided by MQ. Yes. Isn't there a Q? I mean, if you expanded one plus delta M over MQ to the minus two. Why to the minus? So for KSS, I do have the squared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean for KQS. For KQS, there is no squared. Oh, okay. You see? Okay. You okay. have only one power of strange work mass. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> and, and that's why you have this additional factor of two. Yeah, yeah. Yes, because in that case, you have two strange quarks, so this happens to be squared, and then you have twice the difference. Any other question? Okay, so real quick, in the last three minutes, what we can see is that, let's try and sum the mass of the nucleon on the mass of the proton with <clears throat> the mass of the cascade, okay? Mass of proton plus mass of cascade. So let's count the quark masses first. So I have uh, three light quarks in the proton and one light quark in the cascade. So as for masses of light quarks, I have four light quark masses and two strange quarks in the cascade, okay? So these are the, the quark masses part. For the couplings, we have minus one half, minus three half, sorry, for the proton times KQQ. And then for the cascade here, uh, plus one half KSS minus twice KQS, okay? If we use that simplification, this part becomes minus three halves KQQ plus one half KQQ minus delta K. Okay, the factor of two cancels the, the one half. Minus twice KQQ plus twice delta K. You agree? So all together, you have this. So minus three halves 
plus one half is minus one, minus two, it's minus three. KQQ plus delta K. <clears throat> okay. Any question? Good, okay. So now let's try to see what happens if we combine the, uh, the mass of the lambda and the mass of the sigma. Well, first of all, we have to match at least having something proportional to this for, um, um, to, to, to this number of masses for, for the quarks. So, what I can try, and just because I know the answer, but in principle, you can just solve the linear system, summing three times the mass of the lambda plus mm. the mass of the sigma. Okay. The mass of the lambda is here. So I have six light quarks from the lambda and two in the sigma. So this is eight. Okay. And I have one strange quark times three for the lambda and another one from the sigma. So four strange quark mass. So it seems we are getting twice the line above. And let's see if also for the couplings, that's the case. So here I have minus for the lambda minus three halves times three. So minus nine halves KQQ. And then for the sigma, I have plus one half KQQ minus twice KQS. So plus one half KQQ minus twice KQS. Okay, so that means this part is the same. Here I have what? I have minus minus four KQQ. So I must have some type of somewhere, but the thing I care about is this delta K here. Ah, oh, no, sorry. So let's make the approximation first. So this is minus four KQQ uh, minus twice KQQ plus delta K plus twice delta K. Okay, now it works. So that makes minus six KQQ plus twice delta K. And indeed, you see that 3m lambda plus m sigma is twice m proton plus <clears throat> m cascade. And this is the Gelman Kokubo relation that doesn't depend specifically on this model. Actually, you can prove this relation just with group theory, just by uh, making some assumption on how the breaking of the SO3 group happens. And you get this relation. And this is satisfied by the, the spin interaction model we are considering. So this is a good thing, is that there is some, that the, the model we are considering respects the right flavor symmetries. Any questions? If there are not questions, I think that uh, we can finish today here. Okay.
Well, thank you all for listening, if you're still there. Thank you very much for a very nice lecture. Everything was very clear, thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Okay, and we reconvene 